Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Avinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at the New York Review of Books, or tonight, the New York Review of Comics, uh, to welcome Sherry Flanagan for the release of Trots and Bonnie in conversation with Emily Flake. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days, and I wanna give a huge thanks to our guests for joining us tonight. So to some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of your screen to submit them. Uh, we'll be asking those at the end of the program. There's also a chat button here through which I'll be posting a link to purchase tonight's book. Uh, and tonight we're really excited because um, we, are able, we are able to offer signed book plates that Sherry signed for us to anyone who purchases. So extra special tonight um, while supplies last. A caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual events, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads. So please bear with any technical issues that could arise. Uh, we will try to solve them quickly. And finally, we've scheduled a whole host of spring programming leading into the summer for you. So head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Uh, in two weeks, one that I want to point out, we're back with NYRB to welcome Rachel Eisendrath for the release of Gallery of Clouds in conversation with Hisham Matar. Uh, that program is on our website now and taking registrations. So now a little about tonight's guest and we will get started. Sherry Flanagan is a cartoonist, writer, and editor. Her work has appeared in a variety of books and magazines, including The American Bystander, Graphic Classics, and Drunk Stone Brilliant Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon insanely great. After living and working in San Francisco, LA, the Florida Keys, and New York, she now resides where she grew up in the Magnolia neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. Uh, she holds degrees in commercial art, computer technology, web design, and professional technical education and instruction design. She loves post-apocalyptic sci-fi, the artist Charles M. Russell, and walking her dogs. We already had a dog preview over here. Maybe we'll see more dogs later. Um, Emily Flake is a cartoonist and illustrator. Her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Time, and other publications. Her weekly comic strip, Lulu 8 Ball, has appeared in numerous alternative news weeklies since 2002. She lives in Brooklyn. So, Sherry and Emily, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Sherry. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it's so awesome to be like actually talking to you. So um, for people watching, um, Sherry and I have spoken over email, but we have never spoken like face to face, not even with like little faces in a box. Um, so this is very exciting. Um, I am a ridiculously huge fan and I um, was exposed to your work at, when I say like tender age, I mean like, seven um and it, really, <laughs> it it really kind of like made some neural connections that like were very formative in me becoming like you know a cartoonist but also a person so um that is like i owe you a huge credit of debt that a huge debt of gratitude um and, you know, as I said in the introduction to the book, like have been subconsciously ripping you off for years. So thank you and I'm sorry. I don't see that. I don't see the ripping <laughs> off part. <laughs> Influenced by is good. <laughs> I mean, I have artists that I've ripped off too. So I mean, it's, it's, all, good just, thing. it's all just an unending cycle of, yeah. of borrowing and remixing and like. It's a classic way of learning your craft. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, no, absolutely. Um, one of my one of the first assignments I got in art school was like draw something in the style of somebody you admire, and I picked like Ralph Steadman. I'm like, oh, this is impossible. <laughs> like, did you do it? I did it. It did All not right. go well. Really bit off more than I could chew there. Um, but congratulations on the book. I, I feel like this is one of those books that people are like, when is this happening? Like, when is, like, why isn't there a Trots and Bonnie compilation? So um, do you want to talk a little bit about like the, the journey of this book? Why? Well, there was, there was one group that asked to do a, a compilation and they wanted to do it as a comic book and pay me in comic books. So <laughs> you can understand how excited I've been about doing that. <laughs> But um, I, you know, I really didn't have time to do the amount of work I needed to do on mm. this. I just spent five years taking care of my um, husband who had Alzheimer's. Mm. And before that, you know, I was working, I had day jobs. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the perfect time for this. Right. And my friend Norman Hathaway is a person who pulls, he curates art, he curates books, and he finds people who are obscure, but he feels they're important. Mm -hmm. Like he's doing, I think he's doing a, a, a book on pen pen nibs or something now <laughs> which are really important but right you know, yeah yet to seek them out mm -hmm. so he he's been a friend of mine since he was a teenager and uh he did everything on this book and hung out with the new york review of comics guys the editors mm -hmm. and um and then took it from there got me to be involved and hired a photographer to photograph my original art amazing it was it was amazing it was all done in one day and it took a long time and everybody was it was the summertime and everybody was hot lights and stuff like real photographs right. with a great big camera nikon camera very sweaty but fun right and uh so he's he's really instrumental i i told him he doesn't get enough attention for having put this book together he's responsible for you know the the look of it the guys at New York Review of Comics mm -hmm. responsible for for many other parts and also the feel of it. Uh, it's like, gorgeous. Like the it's first time really I felt gorgeous. it, I'm like, this is a real book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's 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 weighty. You know, like it feels good in your hands. <laughs> like, yeah, and I didn't know how many pages they were going to let me put in it. So, right. And it was pretty much as many as you want. So, right. boy, that what a gift that was were there strips that had been like lost to the ages um anything that was hard to find that you had to chase down or i yeah i inventoried my work mm -hmm. and there were like maybe eight or ten things original art and it's big original art it's like it's like 15 by 20 16 mm -hmm. by 20 and um i just i couldn't find them i had you know i was able to retrieve images of them it, it might have i might have chased down some of those but yeah the original art i couldn't find it it was weird right i, I mean i think it's it's because i i'm very bad with how i keep my things and it wasn't until my husband's like a lot neater than i am and at some point a few years ago he was like you might just want to consider putting things in a drawer instead of the like floor and various like corners of your room i'm just gonna just gonna put that out there um and, and where where they're kept cool too right yeah and dry <laughs> <laughs> not to get too into like tech talk but like did you do them on on board were they stiff is it on paper or i this is why i'm doing this with you so we can talk tech talk excellent <laughs> <laughs> nobody's asked me that yeah um we um well the the first trip that I did with my buddies, the Air Pirates, was on a paper bag because I wasn't like accepted enough to be able uh -huh. to work on like real paper. Right. And we used Strathmore two ply plate finish, Ooh, and beautiful. that's been my go to. But some of it's on. I used the color work. I think I I ended up doing that on illustration board, Bainbridge mm -hmm. board right certain kind of i you know i i can't keep it straight whether it's the the, the cold press or the hot press but right and do you uh, use a, a dip pen or like a rapidograph uh a <laughs> a hunts 101 fleur-de-lis point on a dip pen oh and this is this is a really good opportunity for me to show you, I have eight book plates that are going to be available in bookstores. Oh, that's gorgeous. And I just, I'm so proud of these. Mm -hmm. I, it was really fun doing them in there on archival label paper. And so you can use it as a bookmark or um, paste it in as a book plate, but it has acid free adhesive, so it won't hurt the book. I hunted all over. It took me like three days just to find this stuff. And <laughs> and on this are all my tools. And the paper isn't on there, but my pen point is on there. Let's wow. see. The pen point and the um, proportional scale wheel. And uh -huh. I, I like the Higgins bottle. I don't think that was my favorite ink. Right. But, but the but the pen points are the pen points I use and the T square. And oh. it's not in, in proportion, but it's i'll send you a set of these <laughs> that, oh my that is so beautiful <laughs> well it, i 
the iPad Pro is my go-to tool now. It's it really is is amazing to think like how in the past you know even just like the past fifteen years everything has changed in terms of reproduction and ease of sending your work. Um, I mean, I when I, I I interned at the Baltimore City Paper in the '90s and they were still using paste up and stat cameras and. Yeah all this stuff that like just sounds like I'm talking about like I literally used to work for dinosaurs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just joined a like a uh, Facebook group devoted to like old tools of the trade. Um, uh, Cause I, I have a real thing for like dead stock art and office supplies. And I just found like a, a place that has all this dead stock. I put something up on Facebook about it. So like then I joined this group and it's like everybody's showing off like their Ames lettering guides. And I, to be honest, to, full disclosure, never figured out how, the, how to use an Ames lettering supply. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know. This seems very fiddly. Uh, but yeah, just the, the physical difficulty of, of doing like work meant for reproduction has, is just a completely different thing now. Yeah. You know, I've, and I've realized this talking to, people about the book and talking, you know, about tools, but it's, it, the difference is the photography, it's the digital printing process. Mm -hmm. And because people don't really understand that it used to be photographed. And so your black line could be photographed so it didn't break up into pixels. Mm -hmm. And now your black line is always going to break up into pixels. And I was, I was using, you know, I did some paintings that the minute you scan something, it, loses something mm -hmm. yeah and it's you're fighting that now all the time to make right. your lines look crisp and mm -hmm. and and your colors come out the way you want them to mm -hmm. so hard it's it's yeah. much more difficult now i mean I, I bet some i bet some printers are going to be doing it old style sometime just to or if they're not already rather right. than doing digital yeah just I feel like there's so got nice. to be some kind of like boutique research in the way that like there are like vinyl printing plants like you know is somebody somebody willing to make like the actual product the way it used to be to be made. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you noticed kind of a learning curve with with um, learning to draw on the iPad Pro? I love your questions. <laughs> <laughs> total learning curve because yeah. it's procreate yeah right for mm -hmm. anyone who doesn't know this procreate is a ten dollar app mm -hmm. it's better than photoshop it it's is different yeah. in some ways but mm -hmm. it's as good as photoshop for artists who are going to draw something and yeah because nothing is nothing is intuitive in mm -hmm. it it's all learning each little thing that you have to do yeah but once you learn it it's so spiffy and there's no um it's not like a tablet you know where you're drawing on a tablet and then you're watching yourself draw on the monitor right yeah it's like you're right there in real time and yeah. now what see what i can do that's really cool and i hope you will do this too because it answers the question of having something that you can sell when you're old like me <laughs> um you, i do my sketches on like a sketch pad mm -hmm. so i'm doing the cool and this like i i save all my like transparencies and stuff that i do sketches on because i actually love them right. and i do a do a sketch and then like make um what do you call it when you did trans i would transfer it onto a board or something and uh, so, but I saved all those, but now I can do the sketch, take a picture of it with my phone right? and just lay it in as a layer Yeah, and then draw on top of it. So, and then that way you can, you can change the size of it. You know, mm -hmm. you can, oh, I want this to be bigger or you can move things around and all you have to do is just move the layer around. Oh, yeah, it's no, it's amazing. It's amazing. I find myself like double tapping on actual paper now to try like to make it undo and like trying to <laughs> zoom like on like on my clipboard. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I'm like I'm reaching for my eraser. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about about Trots and Bonnie and about the characters um, in this strip and how like 
what are what are the genesis genesis like of of these characters like can you tell tell me a little bit like about how they got born these characters um they were i'm going to try to do this in a straight line and not okay. digress too much but yeah. i was working with a group of people uh guys called mm. the pirates who were um drawing mickey mouse and um but we were like we were like a, a, a little school for people mm -hmm. and it wasn't just us that were that were doing that there were other people in that would come in and out of our studio and a lot of them couldn't handle it and left but, but some stayed and uh so we were in order to find ways to work with each other and other people in doing like comic jams and learning how to draw um, comics, which is different than drawing other things, as you know. Um, so so we, the idea was just to find a, a comic strip that you really loved and draw, try, try to see if you could draw like that cartoonist. Mm -hmm. And it worked really well. It was. <laughs> we could do we could do jams and you couldn't tell who did what you know and this was the writing too so we were doing you know you didn't know what the other person was going to do with the, what you started out with so it was a ama an amazing lesson so uh so at one point i you know i i'd grown up with all these um big new yorker cartoon books in the house of single panel cartoons and um, and I and my dad had books of H. T. Webster, which he was a cartoonist who was drawing in the early part of the century, and so I'd been looking at that stuff. And the thing that I loved about it was it looked like photographs to me, and I just I just thought that's that's what I want to do. I mean, if I have to do something, I'm going to do that. The funny thing is, is like taking that on and designing those characters, who would ever think I would still be talking about them or drawing them now? It's right. so weird. So, um, so that was why they were invented was just because it was kind of the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And they're actual, the characters are actual characters from H.T. Webster's cartoons okay well, bonnie's a little boy uh -huh. um who's in love with a little girl and she doesn't care about him and and uh, there was something about that little boy that i i just related to you know this unrequited love person right and pepsi pepsi just you know she was she's just so i wanted i wanted a character that was so feminine to offset her love of weapons <laughs> 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 and she just worked really well with her little pinafore and <laughs> stockings and things, little booties. So she was fun. The dog, um, my dog now that I just got is, um, he's part Border Collie, but he's mostly English Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at English Shepherds and realizing that that's what the dog that I had as a child, whose name was Bonnie, mm -hmm. was an English Shepherd. My, my dad called her something some other kind of a, a sheltie or something but she was an english shepherd with and they're they're kind of like border collies but they're they're not they have a different traits but they heard things so that's right. the important part and uh so the dog was based on that dog and also um my friend my friend's dog mcbird mcbird <laughs> he, is, he was named after the uh, the play um about the political play in the in the 60s and and he he had taught his dog to come into restaurants and like scoot under the table really fast and just sit there and like so he could feed him under the table which was great because it was the only way the dog was going to get fed at the time so it's a really smart dog and and right. so bird was a heavy influence on me <laughs> that seems like the kind of dog that would figure out how to dispense life advice yeah <laughs> Uh, that's I love what you said about Pepsi's sort of like, you know, very feminine kind of like girly attributes being there to offset 
her love of weaponry because I feel like that kind of ties into one of the like juxtapositions or dichotomies like in the strip itself you know this very like lyrical and beautiful drawing style for this absolutely outrageous pervy message <laughs> um and was that a conscious choice like to kind of um to to put something so hard to swallow into such a beautiful package or like how how did that how did that knit it together it knit itself together for you well shall we shall we try to see whether we can show the video of i have a video of pepsi yeah um i have the first the first um the first pepsi strip and um I am going to try to share the screen if I if, forgive me if it doesn't work. Okay, no. so, but it it did when we practiced it. <laughs> so, this should be. Let's see what happens. Uh oh, it's not showing up at all on my. It might screen. be on. It looks like it. It's on another screen, maybe. Like I have no idea that just doesn't show up. Right oh, I know what's it. I know what it is. There, there it is. This will do socks. it. Hiya, Pepsi. Where are you going? Rifle practice. I'm going to be prepared just in case I should be walking down the street someday and see Hugh Hefner. The only lead poisoning he'll ever get comes from chewing lead pencils. He likes the athletic type, eh? I don't think he'd be impressed. All right, so. OK, now I am going to stop sharing. There, did that work? Could you, could you yeah. hear? Could you yeah. hear? Um, so that's the first time she appeared and she was modeled in my mind after all these women i know who really they their opinions are instant they know it's like they don't they just like well that's stupid you know they just like right away they react to things and i'm not like that at all i have to like think things over for several days before i know how i feel about them Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so it was that, and then this woman, Jackie Zolshan, who I used to go to riots with when I was in, doing anti-war Vietnam stuff, and she literally did have a gun in her purse. Mm -hmm. Not the first friend of mine who carries a gun in their purse. Right. And um, and I really wanted to, you know, I really wanted to talk about those women. I think was right. mostly mostly it and um in my day we were all very sexually adventurous you know right. it was just so much fun because mm -hmm. there there weren't i mean we didn't even know about the normal diseases i mean like <laughs> the clap and things <laughs> like that you know um we didn't get them mm -hmm. not the people we were going with um but uh, so there, there was a, there was just a lot to explore on that level in the seventies. Like somebody pointed out that my work changed <laughs> and became not more conservative, but more aware of the dangers of, of, um, you know, playing in the candy store, like eating too much candy. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and relationships changed. It wasn't just sex. It was it was relationships changed. I mean, with AIDS, suddenly a whole class of people wasn't going to bars and sticking their dicks through a hole in the wall. Right. They, you know, they then then they we got gay marriage because of AIDS. I am mm -hmm. sure, you know, because everybody started thinking more in terms of commitment. Mm -hmm. And as you know, and even in the intervening years between like, you know, 80s and 90s and now, like, what kind of, com this is, this is sort of an abstract question. So like, feel free to like, be like, no, I'm not like, 
what kind of conversations would Bonnie and Pepsi be having now? Like I, I, I find myself wondering when, when I read the strips now, like what would this, what would this look like brought into, into 2021? Good question. <laughs> because no, I think, I think there's a, there's, well, for one thing, um, as far as Trots and Bonnie goes, I, I have done a strip for American Bystander, I think a couple of times and in some other places called Dating with Dogs, mm -hmm. which is more like my story now, mm -hmm. um, you know, like a, a more adult kind of screwed up relationships, but with dogs. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think it, writing for children now, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I can do it. Right, right. I could do it, but I, little kids, everybody knows so much more now. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really all about educating, educating the readership of Lampoon ultimately, but underground comics too, mm -hmm. which is like mostly guys. Right. Yeah, I really thought the audience was mostly guys, and I had a lot to tell them about what it was like to be a female mm -hmm. because we were hearing so much about from their point of view. Right. And um, and now, I mean, back then it was kind of special that I was doing it because not very many other people were, and especially mm -hmm. not doing it the way I was doing it, mm -hmm. which was educating them. So, right. <laughs> um, now everybody's opinions everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody's important. You know, you kind of judge people's fame by the number of followers they have and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and right. uh, it's a different. I mean, it's it's okay with me that I'm not involved at that level. I'm I'm glad I'm not trying to make a living mm -hmm. at it now. Right. So, so what would Trots and Bonnie be like? Yeah. <laughs> would they be middle aged? Right. <laughs> or would they be Would they be kids? I mean, it would be really fun. It would be a challenge to to do that. It would be kind of fun because I mean, the politics now are just so crazy. It's a it's a very different. It's such a different like landscape in in every way, shape, and form. And you know, like you know, again, like revisiting the strips as an adult now was such a different experience than reading them when I was a kid. Because I mean, again, I, when I was a child, it was very exciting to me because I really was very interested in anything with even a whisper of like pornography to it. And then, you know, at like in my early twenties, I felt very aligned with like the subversiveness of it. But then, you know, I'm 43 now and looking at it now, there's part of me that just wants to be like, oh my, you know, <laughs> I don't know when this, strand of pearls appeared around my neck for me to clutch um but it's not even like oh i'm like uh, uh like a sense of being appalled it's just like all oh, these girls these young girls what do we you know? um so it's interesting that like you have a daughter i do i have a daughter yeah. i have a daughter and i know that kids are are pervs but like <laughs> <laughs> But it's such a it is such a tricky thing to address like as an adult or or like a creator. I, have you have you seen Big Mouth on Netflix? Um, it's a cartoon series about like adolescents going through puberty and it's filthy um, and it's wonderful. And it's very I feel like there's a real sort of emotional through line from Trots and Bonnie to Big Mouth because they're very, very honest about what it's like to be an adolescent kid and just, you know, flooded with all these like hormones with no, like with no breaks. <laughs> um, but, you know, which is good mm -hmm. if you think about it because, because we were, we were behaving like that, but we didn't know anything about hormones. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody talked about hormones then. I don't think our parents knew about hormones. Right. Clearly. Yeah, <laughs> is you know I just I think humor humor and 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 comics books everything I I see it all as educational. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I'm not learning something, you know, like Dan Brown's books, mm -hmm. they're so much fun. They're like crazy, wild mystery kind of things, but, right. but they're so educational. Right. You know, it makes it worthwhile, you know, because we don't we don't have that much time. You might as well yeah. be learning something. Yeah. No. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about like educating like the boy cartoonists at the time. And like, I feel like, you know, the, well, what's it like to be a lady in comics? It's like, oh, Jesus. But like, um, <laughs> but there is some, there is a dynamic that I, 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 and I, I wanted to know if you have felt this too. Like, if I'm around a bunch of dudes joking around, I almost feel like I have to be the most disgusting one in the group. Like, I have to punch lower and harder than everybody else just like to kind of prove myself in a way. I don't, I don't know if that is specific to me and my own neuroses or if that's like a thing. I would love to see that. I would love to be there <laughs> while you're doing that. <laughs> um, not, not my, I'm not funny enough to do that, mm. frankly. Um, you're, you're quick. And you are so good and so funny. Um, it, my my specialty was uh, not talking very much and uh -huh. um, sitting with my little notebook and drawing pictures of everybody and then writing down what they were saying. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> which was really and I don't really. I mean, I I will drink occasionally, but I don't drink for pleasure. Mm -hmm. and so I could go to bars and. Um, I, I just I would go and drink a Coke or something. And and people like that if you do that. I think it makes them feel safer. Right. <laughs> than being with some like sloppy drunk women. Right. Like, Where's the know. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, I mean, I just I don't think I'll tell you, for many years I was more scared of women than I was of men. I was used to men. Men are, they're easy. Right. <laughs> Women are complex. In my family, my mother and my sister attacked me constantly, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which, which made me a little twitchy, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've really worked at getting over that because it, it's, it's no fun to not have women friends. And now right. I have like cool women friends. Right. So, uh, but, but at the time I was doing this strip, I would go to the lampoon offices and I would just sit there, you know, and the one time I made a snappy comment about someone, and I don't even remember exactly what it was, everybody just like froze and went like, what did you just say? <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, it hurt their feelings. <laughs> and so were people like surprised, like, you know, if you like, because, you know, your work is so outrageous, did people before they met you expect a personal like outrageousness from you or if they knew you like to be like quieter in person, were they surprised by your work? Expert on sex. <laughs> <laughs> I have one boyfriend who thought that. <laughs> I mean, he didn't think that after he got to know me, but uh, he, right. yeah, you know, I think, I think that's, I think, that, I don't, I'm just guessing, but I think that's what people expect is, right. um, hopefully, hopefully they expect more than I'm just really um, non-judgmental non and, and open. I, I think, right. I think that, um, I don't know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, kind of on the subject of female friendship, I love the friendship um, between between Pepsi and Bonnie. You know, just the the um, the way they sort of like are this like kind of dyad through like around which everything else um, revolves, and even like you know even their focus on, on men or sex or anything else really doesn't seem to, it, it kind of almost feels like in a weird way, they remind me of a filthy version of like 
Anne and Diana from Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which now I would like to see a graphic, like you illustrate a graphic version of Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I just, I thought that was, that, I think that's one of my favorite things about, about the strip is just this, you know, this, like, the, their, their chumminess. Um, and, you know, I don't know if that was like a conscious decision or not, or if it just like worked so well to have them kind of playing off each other or... Well, it, Pepsi drives drives the strip a lot. She's she's the person if you want to talk about sex, sex and drugs and things like that. She's the go to character, mm -hmm. and because she's cognizant of the world. Um, and in terms of their relationship, I mean that could be they could be guys. I think, mm -hmm. I think right. pretty much pretty much like that. I mean people have told me that I think like a guy, which I don't know what that means. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know if that's even a compliment. <laughs> I feel like that people who say that don't know how women really think. <laughs> like, no, <I> don't. <laughs> but but that's the thing. That's really yeah. what they're saying, I guess, is like they're just like mystified, which is so interesting, isn't it? I mean, you, what, is that going to be that like that in the future? Or is that going to get right. better? You know, now that we play sports, you know, right. now that we get paid for things. Right. You know, team sports is everything in terms of women learning how to operate in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but also to that point, like, do you do you think that do you think that women creators can get away with more in terms of especially like really sexual content? Um like, you know, so it, like more than than men can. It, I mean, in, because in some ways I feel like, well, you know, you don't, it, it's harder to get mad at some of this stuff coming from a lady. <laughs> um, for me, mm -hmm. doing this, this comic strip, doing Trots and Body, yeah. I got away with a lot. Yeah. Because I just feel like if you were a male comics creator drawing like, you know, a 13, 14 year old girl naked, like, I feel like there would there, there would have been pushback in a way that maybe maybe not well i was unedited in right. that room. they they just let me do whatever i wanted and, I, and going through my strips i'm like i can't believe they let me do some of the things i did and it's not it's not the sex stuff it's the stuff that isn't right you know? i mean i was like doing like dog food commercials and things right <laughs> and and i think what my theory is this that a lot of people followed the strip because you never it was like it was like here in seattle we would go to the hydroplane races just to see someone crash right that was like it was boring if nobody crashed right I mean, for me anyway yeah. <laughs> that's a terrible thing right. but i think that people followed my comic strip just to see whether the characters would take off their clothes right you know? <laughs> so so i got to slip a lot of other stuff in there i mean right I, looking for looking for um strips to uh like make these videos out of i i'm like I just didn't know how hard a time I'd have looking for them. And it wasn't hard at all. There's a, most of them are pretty acceptable. Mm -hmm. There's one, there's one that I have where Bonnie gets her period in school and she's, she's got like her legs are, there's one panel where her legs are spread and there's like her crotches. It's in black and white. So it's just right. a black blob of blood in her crotch, um, which happens. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, this is this is weird, but we've all seen it in Borat. Right. Right. Hysterically funny. Yeah. Is getting awards, mm -hmm. you know. So no big deal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever get hate mail? I'm I'm smiling because I got a cassette tape from a Nazi. <laughs> More people should do strips like <laughs> someone told me, well, you don't have any black people in your in your comics, but there are. 
Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're there. I don't know why nobody noticed them. Right. But no, I, I didn't get any, any, any real hate mail, just mail from a hater. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, wow, that's, that's pretty. Yeah, no, it was really, it was shocking. It was right. shocking. Yeah. Also, like to your home address, or did that go to the lampoon? I'm, I'm really easy to find. Right, right. Yeah. My 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 phone number is in the in the in the phone book. Which <laughs> it's hard to find now because you can't find the phone book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh God. Um. Well, yeah. I let's. Is there what do you? Is there anything that you particularly want to talk about surrounding the book? Yes. Uh, yeah. I want to talk about. Your great introduction. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, you, okay, so like people don't know this, but I wrote an introduction for you mm -hmm. for Lulu, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, and I, I went back and reread it and it's just long winded. And I think I told you to eat more pie or people should give oh. you pie. I remember oh my, no, like it is a, the treasure of my life that you wrote that introduction honestly it's wonderful I loved your work and I I just I love your introduction so much it it's like it was just uh inspiring to me uh, to, well, I, to read it it's great thank you it was beyond an so honor funny. to be asked to do it <laughs> yeah it's so funny um yeah you know and you it we it it stirred a little discussion about the i I'd, I'd never heard of rubbing one off before so <laughs> you've educated me right. <laughs> so we then i'm like she mentions it two or three times in the introduction you know maybe right. put it in the book and then i was like okay we'll put it in the book you know we're not <laughs> sure about this we'll put it in the book and then i looked at the book and they laid it out and they put it in the front page <laughs> i'm like oh my god <laughs> my local bookstore there i'm going to take the book down to my local bookstore and go like can i sell this here can i sell <laughs> here? and and they're going to open the book and they're the first thing they're going to see <laughs> is this kid masturbating <laughs> <laughs> and we we ended up having quite a, a back and forth on that took it out it's now going to be in the american bystander amazing uh, with with uh, seven other outtakes right so it's it's in there and it's like my little educational uh explanation of how i was just trying to show men that women beat off too and it's really mm -hmm. important for them to know that because right with that i did that back when there was nothing right about women's. i mean it, yeah there was there was no information about that well except between super heavy feminists who weren't talking to men at all so right <laughs> they were talking about all kinds of masturbation right right speculums and things like that right uh, yeah you know i'm sitting here talking to you and i'm going like oh i'm thinking of a whole bunch of trots and bonnie strips i could do right <laughs> <laughs> i never did one about speculums right right there's 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 a whole new world to explore with those characters really <laughs> indeed and and the other thing is i read mama tried and i don't have any children and it's like thank you so much because i feel like i went through the experience with you <laughs> and it was so much fun <laughs> it really was <laughs> Thank you. I always felt like that book really served as birth control. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Oh. I think it would be it would be it's a it's a good shower gift, I think. Right. <laughs> In fact, it, if you threw a shower, everyone at the shower should have one. <laughs> well, thank you. Um yeah, I mean it, it beats a diaper tower or whatever it is people are giving it at showers. <laughs> I was uh uh I I threw a baby shower for a friend of mine um and basically just threw her like a party at my apartment and got very drunk at her baby shower and then realized two weeks later that I too had been pregnant at her baby shower uh <laughs> and just doused to this like little nub of a fetus with all sorts of terrible things um but yeah long story short I don't know how to th throw a baby shower um but um but yeah should we should we that, there's some questions in the Q&A. Should I read the Q&A questions? Sure. All right. 
Um, okay, let's see. Um, love the book, it's a beautiful object, it is. Um, can you talk about how you got involved with National Lampoon originally? Oh, um, yes. I was married to Bobby London, who's one of the air pirates and was another cartoonist. And we spent like eight months living with his parents <laughs> and doing nothing, no housework. They fed us. They took us out to dinner every Friday night. It was like heaven in Queens, New York. So we would take the car and we would go into New York City and we would hang out um, with Michelle Chiquette mm -hmm. and um, some other people at Lampoon and around Lampoon. And uh, uh, so we went up to the office. We had our big portfolios, which is what you had in those days. They were huge. And uh, they, the art director, Michael Gross, looked at our work and said, do this once a month and mm -hmm. gave us both a half page and which was fair. I thought that was just so nice right. and, because they didn't just give it all to me. Ha -ha. Right. <laughs> he, got, he got the, he got the full page before I did. Right. And, um, but so, and that was just the beginning of it, of monthly deadlines. Right. Wherever we were, we were sending artwork into New York and, we'd mail it in, we'd send it, put it on a Greyhound bus and because it was our, we were always late. We only had a day to get it in. Right. <laughs> you can just scan it and send it. Like, you, really, you really have to like build a whole day into your deadline. If, you yeah, know? totally. Yeah. yeah. Um, and was it weird being like I being married to another cartoonist? I think about this a lot because my husband and I don't like work in the same worlds at all and i'm sometimes like and i have seen it work with some people and very disastrously not work with other people so like i don't know was it ever were you ever like going out to the same things or like getting in each other's way or let's just say i would never again be married to someone that i have to compete with right or who thinks they have to compete with me is more right. realistic yeah yeah, so um, although it really wasn't like that, I mean, it was good. It it was good for, for us. I mean, we were young and we we were a, like Sonny and Cher, you know, right. Sonny and Cher of cartooning, right. just people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we we learned a lot from each other, and we had great conversations, and we we had a very kind of friendly marriage, right. That's that's pretty best case. So, so I guess it's, I guess it was good. I, right. And, and, you know, actually, he was not the person who was competing with me. It was my second husband who competed mm. with me. Right. <laughs> he was like funny. So right. he would he was he was writing things and right. and I it just it started to annoy me. So yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I kept him as long as I could. Right. Yeah. <laughs> until keep him until they stop being useful. <laughs> um. So let's see, Sarah Duke asks, I'm enjoying your conversation about having tangible media to sell. Have cartoonists who cre create their art born digital have having difficulty pricing? Oh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. I totally, so what I hear is that many cartoonists underprice their work mm -hmm. or undervalue it. Mm -hmm um or really need money right so number three might be more pertinent than anything yeah um i don't i don't sell much work i i really i've sewn i've sold drawings that where i'm sitting at a table and i'm and i'm doing original drawings we used to sell them for like nice good things that are now in museums they're now mm. in in uh, in the uh oh boy forgetting the name anyway um the uh uh for 35 dollars we, we would do a nice color piece of yeah. artwork yeah and um but i've done i did a beautiful beautiful um full color it was a strip it was never going to go into print so i got to use fabric paint which okay. was kind of luminescent uh -huh. on it and um 
and that the original artwork went away and and I have a photograph of it and I did that for a lot of money I was three thousand dollars at the time because mm -hmm. it was like you know the person would have full rights and all right. that yeah I, I feel like it's so tricky pricing it has always been tricky for me even before the the internet and I feel like I feel like it's it is it is so hard still even now to like figure out like what you know what I should charge especially if it's like a person just a person who wants to like buy something from me I'm like oh don't know and I'm always either like way too low or way too high um and you know budgets for print media are really all over the place and also just with the plur plur geez louise you know what i'm trying to say the yeah the, like the proliferation of <laughs> of like images and social media there's also just like you know and uh, music has this problem too it's just like there's so much out there um for free that it's you know and you're sort of expected to have like a a, a visual presence uh, like um and doing work that you don't necessarily get paid for yeah it's just i don't know it's it's hard money's hard that's why it's, i'm an artist yeah. and not an accountant it's easier just to not sell it yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it's billy ireland is the museum oh has, like, right of course of course yeah it work and yeah. really really cool yeah um so here's another question how do dogs and pets fit into your work how did what how do dogs and pets fit into your work uh, <laughs> besides I, being in the title what do you mean because trots is a dog so like, <laughs> yeah 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 and um I'm trying to think of a smart answer to that. It's just I really I've always had dogs, really mm -hmm. like dogs. And uh I have a cat that acts like a dog, so uh -huh. there's that. And uh but but as a character, mm -hmm. he's he's an important character and he's almost like really I think all my characters in a way are like icons standing for for their nature. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I am a reincarnated dog mm -hmm. because I eat like one. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like a big bowl. I uh -huh. literally have a big bowl, one big bowl. Now that I live alone, I have one big <laughs> bowl and a spoon and I just eat uh -huh. like a dog. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love to ride in a car. Right. <laughs> very loyal. All right. So. Uh, that probably answers that question more than anything else. It's like, right. it's like we're all dogs. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like Trotz is also like a very like grounding character too, you know. And I feel like dogs kind of serve that purpose in a life, you know. They're just like sort of like you know loyal, grounding, uncomplicated um, moral compasses in a way. <laughs> Total moral compass. Good yeah. is a good way to put it too. Mm -hmm. And and in the comic strip, it became like a way to end the, the page, a way to mm. end the strip, because that, if the dog made some sort of comment, you knew the strip had ended. So that right. was, he was helpful just as a, as a writing tool. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, all right, let's see. Um, can you tell us more about the Air Pirates and who was in the studio? Oh, well, um, it was Dan O'Neill, this was in San Francisco and Dan O'Neill had been working for the San Francisco Chronicle and I'm going to say this the simple way his story it, it's not entirely accurate but it was like Dan dropped acid and the strip changed and his <laughs> characters went to magic cookie land and he had always been political like he had a, he did a strip about like spitting on his hand and shaking Ronald Reagan's hand <laughs> and uh, so finally um he had a huge readership and they fired him for what he was saying oh wow yeah so i this is where i'm coming from is 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 from where people were literally killed for opening their mouths you know right saying the wrong right thing. so so there was dan he was he was fired three times mm -hmm. and they kept having to there were there were uh, responses from his his fans and they kept having to hire him back and then then there was the final time and he decided to challenge walt disney it was really his idea 
And um, because of Walt Disney's symbol is a corporate giant. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying not to go on too much about about why we didn't like Walt Disney. Right. But um, there's lots of reasons. And the, mm -hmm. the, the Disney is was sinister. Oh, well, for sure. Say that. Yeah. And it was also linked to corporate American imperialism. Mm -hmm. So, and so Dan's idea was to do these comics, these Air Pirates comics, where Mickey was the villain and all the villains were the good guys. Right. And, and um, the and the 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 little ones were the, the illegitimate children of Mickey and Minnie, and you can imagine what, yeah. how all that went. Yeah. And um, and then he was gonna like hire a bunch of um, homeless, they didn't call them homeless guys then, they just drunks and winos and bums. Okay. He was gonna hire a bunch of them and dress them up in like firemen uniforms and police uniforms and have them <laughs> distribute the, the comics on the streets of San Francisco or drop them from a Zeppelin. Uh -huh. and so we, it was very ambitious. And so he is the fact that, see, I thought that he was rich because he was a cartoonist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we were all uh, Ted Richards, Bobby London, Gary Halgren was a sign painter in Seattle, mm. and a successful one, but I think he was unfulfilled emotionally. I think he was unfulfilled and wanted to do more worthwhile work. So right. he joined up with us. Right. Um, Bobby and Ted had been working in under other underground papers. And so, and we were attracted to Dan because we ended up in the Zoetrope studio, this uh -huh. mammoth warehouse with all the uh, the special effects, all the um, things that had been in THX 1138, the, his movie, like d babies in jars and things. Right. And it was just really fun. We had a place to live. We had a place to crash. So Dan provided a place to crash. Gary's wife brought rice and beans. Right. So... Uh, that was how I ended up with the Air Pirates. Right. Well, actually, yeah. I had to hitchhike from Berkeley for a while to get to San Francisco. But. Has there ever been an Air Pirates, Air Pirates documentary? I mean, this really feels like very tailor-made for like a documentary series or just a, a series series. I, I, I am sorry. I think there is, I think there is something. Mm. Um, and I don't, it's on YouTube. I watched it, okay. and it was very good. And uh, I don't, I don't have the link at hand. Uh, no, that's what I'm doing later tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, probably a Google search would do. Um, let's, let's see. I feel. Are we? Are we? Are we running out of time? Do we have to wrap this up? Or are you asking me? Um, you no, know, you can. You can. Um, you can take a couple more questions if you want. Okay, Thank let's you. maybe let's do like let's do like two or three more. Two or three more. Okay. Um let's see. Do you did you hang around with any of the other women underground cartoonists? I hung around with Michelle Brand. Mm -hmm. Uh not uh, not so I think she's not so well known. She was mm -hmm. also married to another another cartoonist. Hmm. And um, she married, um, oh God, boy, my mind. <laughs> I will think of it five, five minutes from now. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I, I didn't hang around with a lot of underground cartoon women under, in the underground. For one thing, um, Trina was there mm -hmm. when I was there and um, Michelle was there, oh, Laura Fountain was mm -hmm. married to Gilbert Shelton. She was a good friend to me. Okay. And she's now, they're both living in France and she's a literary agent now. Nice. So um, going strong and put together books back then. But I don't, I don't have any really good stories about women in the underground. <laughs> I'm my, hoping this would go into a very gossipy place, but you know, who comes <laughs> No. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to hear about a couple of the artists who inspired you and how you transformed their work in your art. <gasps> Somebody named oh. Chester McKay. That feels, that feels like a... No, but you know who I was looking at I, that mm -hmm. I really loved? 
was uh, Charles Dana Gibson. Mm, oh, right. That makes sense. Yes. And um, in fact, H.T. Webster has one cartoon where he's looking at Charles G Dana Gibson drawing. And Charles Dana Gibson in this cartoon, which I'm, I think is probably pretty accurate, he's, he's drawing, standing up with an easel and a brush and ink. Mm -hmm. Because people don't realize that Charles Dana Gibson was really funny. He, he did actual stories. They always associate him with those, those heads of women with the hair, you know, and the, the perfectly crosshatched. Yeah. And uh, I have the big book that I found. Ooh. It's really rare of Charles Dana Gibson's work. Uh, and it's mostly, it's rare because mostly people um, cut the pages out of the books and frame each individual page. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I learned the cross-hatching techniques from mm -hmm. him. I was, I was looking at his art a lot and really loved him. And, and, and I think he's kind of underappreciated because right. people don't realize that he was a good writer. Right, yeah, true. No, you really do always just think of the Gibson girls. Yeah. Um, yeah. And was there ever a thought of a Trots and Bonnie movie? Um, yeah, kind of, yeah. There, there was a company, in, a Canadian company that came to me and wanted to do a Trots and Bonnie movie. And I am such a team player. I'm the loyal dog. I said, uh, well, I don't know about a movie of my stuff. You know, I mean, I, I'd like to do that, but I'd like to, I think you should do all the Lampoon cartoonists because I really wanted to see that. I would love right. to see a composite of Charles Rodriguez, you know, and Gay and Wilson and just, all those cartoonists would have been that would have been a great movie and the other thing that I think is problematic is that other people really can't draw my characters right yeah because I I look at like at that the Pepsi strip that you saw mm -hmm. the characters are really let's just call it poorly drawn right <laughs> and that's hand that's the muscles in my hand had not developed enough to make them look the way they they look now right right mm. well maybe <laughs> a girl can dream i'm gonna keep holding out for some kind of movie situation um but yeah. i think Let's i do think that right? <laughs> <laughs> no i think i think like maybe a, a netflix series <laughs> yes yeah netflix if you're listening <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sherry, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. Um, it is such a pleasure to meet you. And I'm so thrilled that this book exists in the world. Thank you. Thank you. It's great I'm, to meet you. <laughs> I'm doing an important, I'm doing my important thing, which is um, reminding everyone I am posting the link to purchase the book in the chat. Remember, if you buy the book from us, you get one of these lovely signed book plates. Um, I got my edition without the book plate and I will be having the store send me one. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and just to remind everyone, as we talked about at the start of the program, how lovely this is and how great it is to hold in your hands. Uh, my wife was just walking through during the event and just kept looking over at that and grabbing it. And I was like, I need them for this. So, <laughs> um, otherwise, Sherry, this was so lovely. Thank you so much for giving us uh, your evening. And Emily, for, for the lovely, lovely questions. This has been so much fun. And audience, you were so great. You, we were so active. That is one of the most active events we've had. So <laughs> cheers, everyone. I, uh, I want to take a picture. Take a picture. I am. I'm, I'm taking a screenshot of it. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll give you a good one too, if you want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, and otherwise, that wraps up the evening. Uh, thanks again to the New York Review of Books tonight, the New York Review of Comics. Um, and, and again, Sherry, Emily, so much fun. Um, we'll do it again. The next- It really week. has been fun. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I, tell, yeah. I told you, we just hang out and talk. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good night, Yay. everybody.